Chapter 11 Mrs. Midas was much upset when Mr. Midas told her that John had Dr. Cranium's disease. He said it was chocolatitis, Mr. Midas explained, a worried frown on his face, but he's calling it Cranium's disease because it was his discovery. Dr. Cranium didn't do it, John said. It's magic. It all started after I ate that chocolate. I'm scared, he added. Mrs. Midas sat down and dabbed her eyes with a lace handkerchief. She was crying. Mr. Midas blew his nose, said he had to attend to something, and abruptly left the room. John had been so busy feeling sorry for himself that he had not realized how his mother and father would feel about his chocolate disease. Never mind, mother, he said, putting his arm around her shoulders. It's all right. Really, nothing was all right, but he couldn't bear to see his mother's tears. He kissed her wet cheek. His eyes were shut as his lips softly touched her, so he didn't see the change right away. Then his lips began to feel sticky. He opened his eyes. His mother had turned into a lifeless statue of chocolate. John ran wildly out of the house without thinking where he was going or where, what he was going to do. All he knew was that somehow he must get help. For the first time in a long while, he forgot about himself altogether. Now he didn't care about anything but bringing his mother back to life. Without quite knowing how he got there, John found himself at the corner where he had bought the chocolate box. The lot was no longer an untidy rubbish dump. The neat red brick building with two show windows was exactly where it had been in the first place. But the display of candy he had previously seen in the windows was no longer there. In one window, John saw a chocolate trumpet, a chocolate pencil, and a silver dollar with a piece bitten out of it. In the other window, he saw a cafeteria tray littered with chocolate utensils and the remains of a chocolate lunch. Clearly, this place was the right one. Clearly, the proprietor must know a lot about John's hateful chocolate touch. John rushed into the store. The proprietor was standing behind the counter, carefully polishing something small and round and flat and silver. I was just thinking of you, he said. John had no time to waste on pleasantries. Remember the old coin I found and gave you and you gave me a magic chocolate? He demanded without waiting for a reply he babbled on. I ate it and it made everything that touches my mouth turn to chocolate and I kissed my mother and now she's chocolate and I've got to change her back. <clears throat> Easy now, murmured the storekeeper. Calm yourself. There was an expression of satisfaction in the old man's eyes. It's all your fault, John declared. If my mother isn't made better again, I'll fight you till you're dead. My goodness, the storekeeper exclaimed. Whose fault did you say? Yours, John said. If you hadn't taken that money, I wouldn't have. Now, John, the storekeeper interrupted. I must insist on honesty. I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about your mother for a change. Unselfishness is important. But honesty is also important. If you'll be truthful, perhaps I can help you. John's ears reddened. It was becoming unmistakably evident to him that he had only himself to blame for all his, this unhappiness. He looked straight into the storekeeper's eyes. I'll do anything. I'll work for you all my life for nothing if you'll turn my mother back. You could turn me to chocolate instead if you want. You... The storekeeper apparently ignored, ignored John's offers. You were right, John, he said. When you guessed that I had something to do with your acquiring the chocolate touch, but you yourself earned the coin that bought the chocolate touch. Only greedy people can even see that kind of money. Dr. Cranium was right up to, the point, up to a point. I suppose that one could say that you had chocolatitis but it was just an outward sign of selfishness. My mother, John reminded the storekeeper frantically. My mother's turned to chocolate. Do something about it. Oh, please do something about it. I'm glad that you are concerned, the storekeeper commented unhurriedly. Part of your cure is to be concerned about other people. You have been so greedy that you didn't care what happened to other people. Oh, I know, I know, John admitted woefully. But please decide about me later, and please take my mother, make my mother better now. 
Well, John, the storekeeper said, if you had to choose between getting rid of your chocolate touch and restoring your mother to life, which would it be? For one moment, John couldn't help imagining a future of all chocolate meals. The thought was terrible. But then he thought of his mother as she had been when he had left her, a motionless chocolate statue, unable to speak, her chocolate hand still holding her lace handkerchief. Without further hesitation, John said, Help my mother. Well, John, the storekeeper said, I'm going to give you another chance. When next you go to school, your chocolate pencil will be a real wooden pencil with lead in it. But, John began to protest, what did the pencil matter? The chocolate knife and fork and spoon you left on your tray in the cafeteria will have turned back to metal. Your chocolate trumpet will be a shiny golden one again. But, John said, don't worry about Dr. Cranium's spoon. He will find a whole silver one on the floor where the broken chocolate one lay. But how about, John said, Susan Buttercup will discover that the chocolate stains on her party dress and her party shoes were nothing but water after all. Her silver dollar will be all right. John can st could stand the suspense no longer. My mother, he shouted. What about my mother? Will she be all right? The storekeeper smiled. Why don't you run along home and find out, he suggested. John turned without even saying goodbye and ran out of the store. The storekeeper went back to the disc that he had been polishing, a, size the sa a disc the size of a quarter. It had to be polished smooth, ready for a new set of initials in case the need for them should arise.